Hello everyone and welcome to this second video on using an RTL dongle to decode temperature readings from a temperature sensor. The previous video ended with me showing the pipeline to have a look at the demodulated signal. Now the pipeline that you can see right here is a modification of that previous pipeline and consists of two major changes. The first one is that instead of feeding the magnitude data in the top branch of the pipeline and the um, demodulated signal data in the bottom part of the pipeline into a scope sync, I'm feeding it into this uh, TFA telegram sync. And this TFA telegram sync is a custom module that we'll have a look at. The second change is that in the previous pipeline I um, I was streaming uh, the demodulated signal directly into the scope. Now, in this modified pipeline, I have this threshold block in between the sync and the output of the demod block. And the, what this uh, threshold block here does is it looks at the input sample, and if that input sample is lower than 0.4, it outputs a 0, and if it's higher than 0.6, it outputs a 1. So there is a little bit of hysteresis there too. And this, this allows me to clean up the signal a little bit. However, th this filter is really crude. So there, there would be much better ways to do it, but I figured uh, for my purposes, um, this appears to be sufficient. So next we'll have a look at the code that is used to make this TFA telegram sync work. And then we'll have a more detailed look at the waveforms and figure out how the bits fit together to encode the temperature reading. The whole pipeline is running right now and you can see that um, the, this is now decoding a temperature of 22.6 degrees C and as a matter of fact if I hold the base station into the camera you can see that indeed this is also what uh, the base station showing so um, this this works and um, that's actually pretty cool if you think about it. I followed the GNU radio tutorial that I will link in in the description to generate my custom TFA telegram sync block and in this tutorial you run a function that generates a stop for your actual block and this stop is, is a Python class that consists of two methods. Apart from the constructor here that sets up a bunch of things, um, you get this work method here and what you have to do is you have to fill out the work method with uh, whatever this block is supposed to do. The work method gets called repeatedly by the framework and there is there is two parameters. The first parameter is an array of all your input streams and the second parameter is um, an array of output streams that you can write to. Now because this is a sync, um, I'm not using the output items parameter at all. I'm just using the input items parameter and as I said, this is an array of all the input streams. So in this particular case, because this block has two inputs, um, the magnitude and the waveform input, uh, I can pick apart this input items array into two arrays. So the, the first array goes into in zero and the second one into in one. And this really gives me two arrays, or actually in Python these are just lists that I can use to access the data that is streamed into this block. And starting from here, all I'm doing is essentially bit manipulation. This is why I will explain this on a sheet of paper because the, the code itself is not very interesting, but it's more interesting to look at um, how I analyze the waveforms and how I figured out uh, where exactly in this stream of zero and one bits uh, the temperature is actually encoded. This is a printout of the scope screen that I showed you in the previous video. There is a bunch of interesting things to see here. First of all, uh, the blue trace is close to zero, let's say way below one, 
when the temperature sensor is not transmitting and as soon as it starts to transmit uh, this magnitude uh, trace here goes way above actually the scale of, of uh, the scope screen here. So, as I explained before, I'm using this um, to trigger um, and to, to find where I have to look for this, this data packet. Second, the green trace is the data as you get it from the DMOD block. And at this point I have to say that in the previous video in the end uh, I was showing this green trace and I was saying something like uh, and this almost looks like bits or, or something like that. But when I rewatched my footage I realized that this waveform was pretty distorted. Mm, it turns out that there's a little bit of a grounding issue on the USB plug of my RTL SDR dongle that that distorted this uh, waveform pretty badly. So I set up everything properly and I recaptured the waveform and what you see here is actually how it should look like. The red trace is new and the red trace is what is fed into the TFA sync block. That is after this uh, uh, threshold filter that I put in between to, to clean up the signal a little bit. You can see that uh, there is a reasonable, a reasonably nice um, segregation between 0 and 1 here and what is of particular interest is that at the very beginning of mm, this data there is this particular transition scheme between 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Because I had designed a, a few of these protocols before I knew exactly what I was looking at. This is, this is called a preamble and is mainly used for two reasons. The first reason is that inside your receiver you have to know where to look for the bits. You have some sort of reading frame that you're aligning with, with this packet here. And if you know exactly that your data packet is going to start with this particular transition scheme, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, then you know where you have to start reading the bits and you also know approximately where further bits are going to be in time. The second reason for having a preamble with this um, particular transition scheme is that you, you have to realize that some of these transmitters for example, this, uh, this, this temperature sensor, they somehow they have a crystal oscillator or something as a time-based reference. And these crystal oscillators uh, tend to drift, especially with temperature, and because this is a temperature sensor, it's, it's supposed to work um, across a fairly broad range of temperatures. Now, I measure the pulse width of one bit and it turns out that, that it is approximately 58 microseconds. If you're off by just one microsecond, then this uh, accumulates pretty rapidly. Imagine here these are 64 bits, so if you're assuming 58 microseconds for one bit, but it turns out to be 59 in reality, you're going to look for the last bit maybe maybe somewhere here um, and you're going to look for it at the wrong place. So what you can do is you can use this preamble to lock a local oscillator to the particular frequency of, um, of the bits that are sent by the sensor and you can mitigate some drift of the crystal oscillator or whatever is generating the time reference inside the sensor using this strategy. So um, what I did next is uh, I used my TFA sync block to, uh, to parse this data. Particularly, I sampled each bit um, individually and dumped it into a file. So for each temperature reading, I got, in this particular case, it would be 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, two more zeros, another one, a zero, two ones, a zero, three ones, and so on. And I captured a lot of data. I actually put my sensor in front of the window. It was, I think, like nine degrees C outside, and I could watch the temperature drop, and I kept capturing these data packets, uh, as I explained just now. In addition, I wrote down each temperature um, reading on that, that I was reading from, from the base station, and then I proceeded with some statistical analysis of the data I gathered. 
The first plot on this sheet of paper is an aggregated representation of all the packets that I collected. And this plot works as follows. For each bit there is one rectangle and if that bit was consistently one across all the packets that I gathered, um, the, the rectangle is painted in black and if it was consistently zero, uh, the, the rectangle is painted in white. So you can see that here, for example, the preamble that we discussed before is consistently a 1, then consistently a 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. But if the bit sometimes is 1 and sometimes 0, it is painted in some shade of grey. And generally, the darker the rectangle, the more uh, ones I collected relative to the zeros that I collected. You can see here in, in the last byte that everything is grey. This means that there was no consistent bit pattern, but each packet had its individual one, zero, zero, one maybe, and it, it wasn't really the same across any packets. From experience, I, I knew that this was most likely a checksum, which is a way to validate that, that the data you received is actually correct. So imagine the data is actually in byte 1 to byte 7. And on the sender side, you take these 7 bytes and you calculate a number out of that. And you append that number as 8th byte to the packet that you're sending. On the receiver, you receive bytes 1 to 7 and you run the bytes that you received through the very same um, calculation to get again that number, which you then compare to the number that you received in the eighth byte uh, that was sent by, by the sender. And if both numbers are the same, it means that most likely there wasn't any transmission error or anything like that. And this gives you some confidence in um, your numbers that you received actually being correct. So um, having byte one and byte eight explained, the only place where anything is changing is here around byte 6. And because uh, I knew that I was receiving different, different temperatures, uh, something had to be different. So anything that is plain black or plain white in this plot cannot be a representation of the temperature. So the temperature must be encoded somewhere around here. I then looked at um, three different examples, or actually more, but I'm, I'm just uh, showing three here. And the first one is a reading of a temperature of 30.6 degrees C, the second one of 25.2 degrees C, and the third one of 8.5 degrees C. And I, I looked at um, this segment around byte 6. For example, here in the lower part of byte 6, there is 0, 1, 1, 0. If you convert that to decimal, that's 2.4, is a 6. For the high part of byte number 6, it's all zeros, that's easy, so that's just a 0. And in fact, the temperature reads 30.6, so that is a 0 and a 6 right there. But if you look at the low part of byte number 5, you have a 0, a 1, a 1, and another 1. That is 1 plus 2.4 is 7. But if this scheme checks out, it should be a 3. So there is something that's a little bit weird here. Um, looking at the second example, we get exactly the same. The low part of byte 6 is 0, 0, 1, 0. That's just a 2. Point 2.2, so that checks out. 0, 1, 0, 1 is 1 plus 4. That's a 5. The 5 in 25. And uh, 0, 1, 1, 0 is 6. But we actually should have a 2. And the same holds also for the third example, that's a 5.5, that's an 8, it's 8.5 degrees. Um, but instead of the 0 here, we have a 4. And most likely the reason for that is that whoever implemented this protocol didn't want to bother really with negative temperature uh, temperatures. So they probably just said, you know, it's never going to get below 40 degrees or our sensor cannot measure temperatures below negative 40 degrees anyway. So um, we'll, we'll just add a 4 there and um, on the receiver we subtract that 4 again and we're good to go. Because if you, if you subtract 4 from 7 you get 3, if you subtract 4 from 6 you get 2 and if you subtract 4 from 4 you get 0. So um, in the end you just have to subtract the 4 uh, and you can also deal with negative temperatures um, just by shifting 
uh, this digit by four, as I explained. So uh, I implemented this into my my uh, um, Python sync, and um, that already uh, was quite successful in uh, in displaying the temperatures. You might have noticed that uh, I didn't really focus on the parts that I didn't understand. Instead, I focused on the parts that I wanted to get, uh, that is, the temperature values, and I ignored everything else. There was a few byproducts, for example, I managed to figure out where the preamble was, and that there was a preamble, and uh, most likely this last byte here is a checksum, but uh, I don't know anything uh, about the rest. And that's not really important either, because uh, all I care about is, is to get the temperature somehow. But still, um, if you're interested in what the rest might be, I actually realized that when I take the battery out uh, of the sensor and put it back in, uh, some parts of bytes 2 and 3 change. Uh, but they're then consistently different. So if I rerun the whole thing, this is again plain white or plain black. It's just a different pattern. So I think that some part of byte 2 is actually a designator to, um, to designate the sensor and the remainder of byte 2 and byte 3 is some random number that is, that is generated when you uh, first insert the battery into the sensor and synchronize it with the base station. And I guess that is because um, you don't want the base station to, to pick up uh, sensor readings from other sensors that, that might be mounted somewhere else. So that's why you synchronize the base station with your particular sensor and um, uh, using, using, using that number you can figure out that the reading you're receiving is really from that sensor. Or you could use that to uh, use two different sensors maybe on two parts of the houses and to disambiguate um, and the readings from these two sensors. Last but not least, some of the sensors from this manufacturer also support the humidity readings. So I guess that maybe in, in byte 7 here or maybe around here um, there is a potential option of encoding uh, of encoding humidity readings, um, although I have no idea where it is because I don't have the sensor. But if I had the sensor, I could repeat the whole procedure and I would get some gray blocks either here or here and I'd immediately know that this is where I have to look at. Okay, I hope that uh, you gained some value in seeing me uh, proceeding through all these steps and uh, explaining my, my process of thoughts. If you have anything to add to that, uh, please do so in the comments. And uh, the next video will actually be again about the electronics. <laughs>